Hello and welcome to this week's Out of Cast, your program completely in English, as it is pretty obvious. I'm Helga the Bluehead, your only host today. Yes, I'm um, I'm just by my, uh, my own today. And uh, we're still talking about movies about World War II, but today we will get to uh, older movies, let's say. Um, some, let's say, um, classic movies. So... Without any further ado, let's get to them and talk about them. Try. Bloody products. Okay, this is out of cast. You steal your program completely in English uh, to improve your knowledge about cinema. Now, uh, before um, getting into the movies and talking about them, let's say that we are all over social media. So you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, with Roma Tray Radio. Also, you can listen to us live on the app Tune In Radio. So, our first movie that we want to talk about is a huge classic movie that everyone loves, uh, and it's Casablanca, coming out in 1942. Now, some movies really never get old and remain in uh, remain in the mind of the people for an eternity. Casablanca is for sure one of those uh, movies. Uh, now, the gentleman type of Humphrey Bogart uh, at his first true romantic role uh, with the companionship of Ingrid Bergman uh, has made such an iconic masterpiece that unfortunately many may not know uh, the director or seem to have forgotten him. Uh, and it's our job to tell you that Michael Curtis um, has made this one-of-a-kind masterpiece. Now, it is World War II, Casablanca. Rick Blaine is an exiled American and former freedom fighter, uh, runs the most popular uh, night uh, spot in town. Uh, the cynical lone wolf, Blaine comes into the position of two valuable letters of transit. When Nazi Major Stresser arrives in Casablanca, the uh, sycophantic police captain Renault um, does what he can to please him, including detaining a Czechoslovak uh, underground leader, Victor Laszlo. Now, much to Rick's surprise, Laszlo arrives with Ilsa, Rick's one-time love. Now, the very special thing that makes this movie very special, very great, is that it speaks to that soft spot uh, of ours that seek some kind of inspiration and redemption. On some level, every character in the story receives the same kind of catharsis um, and um, their lives are irrevocably changed. Rick has one of the more notable character arcs. He learns to live again instead of hiding from a lost love. Now, he uh, is reminded that there are things in the world more novel and important, and he wants to be part of that. And he is ready to also to sacrifice. Now, Captain Louis Renault, uh, the scoundrel, gets his redemption by seeing the sacrifice Rick makes and is inspired to choose a side where he had maintained careful neutrality. The play, uh, the play's cast consisted of 16 speaking parts and several extras. The film scripted enlarged it into 22 speaking parts uh, and hundreds of extras. The cast, notably international, uh, only uh, has only three uh, credited actors that were born in United St uh, States, which are Bogart, uh, Dooley Win uh, Wilson, and Joy Page. Also at the box office, it is uh, gained 3.7 million. Also with rentals and initial U.S. release, it is said that it has got more than 6,859,000. And it has the awesome, almost perfect Rotten Tomatoes score of 97%. It has also got three Academy Award winning for Best Picture, Best Dir uh, Director, and Best Screenplay. Also, five more Oscar noms, including the Best Actor in Leading Role. Also, film critic Roger Ebert called Ingrid Bergman's performance luminous and commented on the chemistry between her and Bogart. She paints his face with her eyes. Moving on to The Great uh, Escape, coming out in 
1963. Now, the story is about a group of British prisoners that are moved inside a highly high security German prisoner camp where nobody has ever escaped from. After several useless attempts, uh, Roger Bartlett, played by Richard Attenborough, uh, es um, establishes a complex uh, escape plan based on three tunnels, which should allow the run of 250-ish prisoners. Now, the realization of the tunnels is studied and made quite um, uh, meticulously, thanks to knowing Kimen like a safe cracker, a, a forger, a carpenter, etc., uh, to build a web of cooperation all over the camp, hoping everything goes as planned. Although the, the movie is almost three hours long, it doesn't really feel like it, thanks to the building and what we mean is that a well-built script and ever-present tension that doesn't uh, concede a break to the prisoners. It is especially interesting coming to know how they help each other with many different skills and abilities to build the three tunnel. The cast is indeed very accurate, with every character being portrayed by the right-faced actor. The, that being said, the movie doesn't focus on the sermonizing or soul probing. It's pure escapism mixed with uh, with the mechanical work of men and the fate of uh, in one common goal of freedom, much like Escape from Alcatraz. This, uh, the Great Escape has become one of the most iconic movies ever with an intense adrenaline rush. Now, other than one of the highest grossing films of 1963, and it has been referenced in many other media and works of fiction like Charles uh, Bronson's role being mentioned in Quentin Tarantino's Reservoir Dogs. It received many, many nominations for Academy Awards, Golden Globe, but eventually won Best Actor for Steve McQueen at the Moscow International Film Festival. Now, the movie met a very positive response from both critics and public, gaining a 94% on Rotten Tomatoes. Also, the New York Times wrote, uh, but for much longer than is artful or essential, The Great Escape grinds out its tormenting story without a peak beneath the surface of any man, without a real sense of human involvement. It's a strictly mechanical adventure with make-believe men. Okay, so this one that I want to talk about right now is a real tearjerker. So bring up some tissues right now. Because I'm about to talk about Grave of the Fireflies coming out in 1988. It's a Japanese animated war film based on the 1967 semi-autobiographical short story of the same name by Akiyuki Nozaka. It was written and directed by Isao Takahata and animated by Studio Ghibli, set in the city of Kobe, Japan. Uh, on an evening in 1945 after Japan's surrender at the end of World War II, and in a train station, the young Seita dies of starvation alone. Uh, the rest of the movie tells us in flashbacks how things have come to this, the story of Seita and her younger sister Setsuko, uh, two young Japanese children growing up in the waning days of War uh, World War II, their family torn apart by the war, and then the young siblings trying to survive on their own. The movie em emotionally will definitely break you down. Many, including myself, uh, will say that this one is the most heartbreaking Studio Ghibli movies, but I dare to go one step further and say that this movie is one of the most heartbreaking movies about the Second World War ever made. Uh, in fact, by making this story into an animation, they made it more emotional and, and effective. The movie is seriously very hard to watch. It may not be actually very suitable for the children under 10 to watch it, and also for the uh, adults, it really is hard to watch because it has serious impact on them. 
um, also uh, I'm not saying all of these on a negative point of view but uh, it really makes you think harder on the consequences of war on children's lives now this movie really does a perfect job demonstrating how much exactly the war impacts the lives of innocents and of course children now more on that what makes this movie more astonishing is that you can just uh, see it as a world war ii movie but it's actually more than that uh, especially in nowadays situation and what is happening in uh, the wars in Middle East and Syria, etc. Now, on technical side, uh, the, at the first viewing, I couldn't believe that this movie came out in 1988. So that's how good it was. And it's Studio Ghibli, for God's sake. I mean, how? what would you expect from that? The, not to be good and awesome? So the music, the visuals, the voice acting, they all work out really fine and at the end you have a masterpiece I dare to say. Um, the film is ranked number 12 on total films 50 greatest animated films. It was also ranked at number 10 in times, uh, Time Out's the 50 greatest World War II movies list. Empire Magazine ranked the film at number 6 in its list of the top 10 depressing movies, that's what I was telling you. Unfortunately, it wasn't nominated for any major award and only it sold just a bit more than half a million dollars at the US box office, but it has got a 97% on Rotten Tomatoes, with the critics consen uh, consensus uh, an achingly sad anti-war film, Grave of the Fireflies, is one of Studio Ghibli's most profoundly beautiful hunting works. See. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to another sad World War II movie. I mean, all of them are kind of sad, but um, Grave of the Fireflies is super sad. And then this one that I want to talk about right now. Schindler's List coming out in 1993 is also sad again and uh, also with that musical score that everyone knows and it's so notable and uh, it will tear you up and uh, it's by John Williams I mean who's the one that always has that soundtrack that tears you up it's John Williams so anyways uh, in German occupied Poland during World War II, industrialist Oskar Schindler gradually becomes concerned for his uh, Jewish workforce after witnessing their uh, persecution by Nazis. Now that's why Schindler, a former Nazi party member, turns into an unlikely hero by saving uh, 1,200 Jewish people from concentration camps all over Poland and Germany. Faithfully based on the real events occurring in the novel by the same name by Thomas uh, Kennelly. Uh, Steven Zillan's screenplay shines under Steven Spielberg's direction, blending the horror of the Holocaust uh, with uh, his tender humanism to create a unique masterpiece. Actually, under production, the atmosphere was so grim and depressing that Steven Spielberg asked his friend Robin Williams, may he rest in peace, uh, if he could tell some jokes while Spielberg would uh, watch some Seinfeld episodes on TV. And guess what? Some of Williams' sketches uh, while uh, played through the speakerphone to the cast and crew ended up being part of the dialogue material for the genie in Aladdin. So, uh, oh, and also, by the way, Aladdin will come out in about a couple of weeks. So, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, um, on the technical standpoint, what is the most, uh, um, apart from the music, um, the most notable thing that everyone will notice also from the trailer is uh, the cinematography, which is truly astonishing and it is shot in black and white uh, only only apart from uh, the uh, the uh, sequence with the little girl with a uh, red coat so um, I'm not going much further because you this is a must-watch film uh, so 
uh, it stars Liam Neeson as Os uh, Oscar Schindler, Ben Kingsley as uh, Idrak Stern, uh, Rafe Fiennes as uh, Amon Goth, and uh, Caroline Goodall as Emily Schindler. Now, Schindler's list has won over 80 different prizes, among which an Oscar for Best Direction, Best Film Editing, and Best Original Score. As I said, this score is awesome. It is just beautiful. Now, three Golden Globes in 1994, and even a surprising Norway prize, the Amanda Awards for Best Foreign Film on the same year. Now, at Rotten Tomatoes, the audience score and tomato meter seem to agree for once, uh, establishing a perfect 97% on both sides. Uh, Schindler's List, unlike other Spielberg's work, uh, works, had a very moderate body budget to start with, an estimated $22 million, uh, which fortunately it got repaid very well at the box office due to a general gross of $96 uh, million worldwide. Um, I think it is. Uh, it was a pretty suiting music that was playing. Stairway to Heaven. I normally don't mention the music, but uh, Stairway to Heaven really matches the theme here. So um, right now we're in 1997. Uh, speaking about life is beautiful. Partially, it is inspired by the book. In the end, I beat Hitler by um, Rubino Romeo Salmoni and by the lead actor's father who spent two years in a German, uh, German labor camp during World War II. Life is beautiful or like Italians call it La Vita è Bella surely is a peculiar project on its own just like the plot. When a happy-go-lucky Jew, uh, Jewish librarian and his son become victims of the Holocaust, he uses a mixture of will, humor, and imagination to protect his son from the dangers around their camp. Starring Roberto Benini, who is both director, co-writer with Vincenzo uh, Cerami, and plays the role of Guido Orefice, Nicoletta Braschi, uh, real-life Benini's um, wife, who plays as Dora, Giorgio uh, Cantarini as uh, Josue, uh, Giustino Durana as Uncle uh, Eliseo, and also Marisa Parades as Dora's mother, also Horst uh, Buchholz as Dr. Lessing. Oh, again, so many tough names. I am again sorry for if I have mispronounced any of those names. It has been one of the most recognized modern Italian films worldwide. It even got three Oscar for Best Actor in a Leading Role to Roberto Benini, Best Original Dramatic Score, Best Foreign Language Film, and also four other nominations. A BAFTA Award for Best Performance uh, for an Actor, uh, again uh, for Benini. Also, other than 60 wins all around the globe and 51 nominations as well. However, it's not absolutely a perfect product, we may say, and maybe a little bit overrated over time for two relevant reasons. Now, Benini's uh, directional work led some unpleasant mistakes to happen on set. First of all, Nicoletta's Bra uh, Nicoletta Braschi's performance shows how much she's not an actress to be honest and i mean um seriously now second the controversial <laughs> the, uh, again the controversial thing choice that uh, is it's not shown that the soviet troops freeing the camp's prisoners just like 
it actually happened and in the movie they show that actually US troops um, well, they were replaced now nevertheless we can't absolutely deny how much life is beautiful did a great job at the box office gaining more than 229 million dollars worldwide uh, out of an estimated budget of 20 million at that time on Rotten Tomatoes the audience score reaches an extremely high at 96 percent however the critics don't think like that and they have given it an 80 percent Guarda, Eleonora ha scritto questo. E, 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 io, non è mio. <ride> no, non è mio. Eh, però, però io eh, cioè, eh, mi fido di Eleonora. Uh, quello che. Eh, okay. Vabbè. <ride> <laughs> Moving on to The Thin Red Line coming out in 1998. It is adapted uh, from James Jones' autobiographical 1962 novel. This modern version, quote unquote, I'm saying modern and I will tell you why. Uh, of the Thin Red Line uh, returns once more to talk about the uh, Guadalcanal uh, conflict during the World War II by a veteran point of view. And as, as I said, modern version because there has been already a movie adaptation by Andrew Morton in 1964. The latter has been described as a failure to, proper, uh, to portray Jones's experience as a veteran finding it very hard to show any real horror of the production code the script or the director himself who simply didn't want or uh, didn't know how to do it at all now you may ask is terrence malick's version any better it sounds a bit rude and i'm sorry for that but yes totally it it is awesome uh, now it stars jim cavazel uh, as private wit uh, ben Chaplin as Private Jack Bell, Sean Penn as First Sergeant Edward Welsh, Nick Volt as Lieutenant Colonel Gordon Toll, Adrian Brody as Co-Captain Fag, Malix. The Thin Red Line has been acclaimed for its incredible cinematography. I mean, almost all of his movies has a brilliant cinematography, to be honest. It is since its sincere adaptation from the source material, and of course, it cast of eager stars as well now unfortunately even if the movie received seven oscar noms for best picture best director best screenplay best cinematography uh, best sound best film editing best original dramatic score uh, 20 wins all around the world and other 40 nominations it didn't save the sinking money ship that the movie got to be uh, starting off with a 52 million uh, dollar budget, it did terribly at the box office. Uh, at the very first uh, opening weekend, with 11 million dollars, and uh, at the end of distribution period, it got back six, uh, sorry, 36 million dollars. As many people have pointed out, maybe all of this happened because the Thin Red Line came out in the same year as Saving Private Ryan by Steven Spielberg, which has been much more successful than ever. So uh, I dare to point out that Saving Private Ryan came out in July while the thin red line came out on christmas day and for such movie coming on christmas it is not a really good distribution date to be honest um now in spite of all that on rotten tomatoes both the critics and audience found it pretty good giving it a big thumbs up to a general 79 to 80 percent moving on to the movie that i was talking about uh, that came in 1998 and was so successful and i'm talking about saving private ryan now it is based on a true occurrence written on 
Stephen E. Ambrose's 1994 bestseller D-Day Saving Private Ryan follows the Normandy landings where a group of U.S. soldiers go behind enemy lines to retrieve a, a, a paratrooper whose brothers have been killed on the battlefield. Starring Tom Hanks as Captain Miller, Tom Sizemore uh, as uh, Sergeant um, Horvath, uh, Edward Burns as Private Rib uh, Ribbon, Vin Diesel as Private Cap uh, Capazzo, and finally Matt Damon as the title Private Ryan. Saving Private Ryan has been described by several critics as another winning performance by Tom Hanks, which combined with Steven Spielberg's direction, it made it possible to create a realistic war film that uh, redefined the entire genre and it, it is even screen uh, it's even um, you can find it I mean on the Rotten Tomatoes website so it is that much huge um, the movie be, uh, becomes soon a cult classic gaining lots of Academy Awards such as a uh, as Oscar for best uh, director for Steven Spielberg best cinematography to uh, Jan uh, Janice uh, Kaminsky, Best Sound, Best Film Editing to Michael Kahn, uh, Best Effects, Best Picture to Golden Globes in 1999 for Best Drama, Motion Picture and Best Director and even an unexpected nominee on the Japanese Academy Awards in 1999 for Best Foreign Film. But unfortunately, it lost to LA Confidential eventually though. Now, even if the project started with a rather moderate budget of $70 million, uh, it became a huge success thanks to an incredible box office value of $481 million. For, and for a war movie, that is like a lot. And remember, we are in 1998. Now, that's a whole lot, let me tell you. On Rotten Tomatoes, you will find a very high score between 93 and 95%, both from the critics and audience score. Some might say that the movie is filled with way too much technical mumbo-jumbo and wizardry that sacrifices part of the human soul on the project, but we can all agree on Spielberg's accomplishment to make an action filled anti-war film that doesn't glorify or lie about the real events that happened during the combats on World War II. I mean, this movie is a treasure in film history. Have some respect. So, um, this has been a pretty grim um, out of cast show. I mean, we norm our show is normally not that grim and not that much sad, but then again, this is uh, some movies about World War II, so yeah. Uh, but we are not yet done with movies about World War II. I mean, even when you search it on the Google, it, the, many great movies just come up. So um, we have another show on movies about World War II, and then we're done. I promise. <laughs> And then we'll move on to a really, really interesting thing. Um, but I'm not going to tell you because it, it should remain as a, um, let's say, um, as a surprise. So thank you for, uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. And also don't forget that we are all over in social media. You can follow us, uh, Roma Tree Radio on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Also, you can the streaming is is on website if you are not listening i mean what the hell and also the, you can use the app tune in and um, if you and uh, if through the uh, show if you heard uh, jingles and the dingling sound it it's been my necklace with the few bells on it yeah this is this is it <laughs> so um this has been helia the blue head and your program out of cast i hope you that you have enjoyed um today's show and uh again thank you for tuning in and goodbye <laughs>